Okay, hopefully today goes, or this lesson goes better than the uh, one for AP Physics, which I had to record three different times because I hate technology and today was just horrible. Anyway, so let's hope this works. So I sent you all this file, um, and it's kind of a summary of the big ideas of, of this intermolecular forces. So when you look at one of the kind of the cool things about chemistry, and it fundamentally is physics, is that what gives properties to a substance in terms of are they solid, are they liquid, are they gas? And so when you look at the, and I've already sent you these lecture notes, and you have to keep in mind the difference between intramolecular and intermolecular. So the easiest way to remember this is like intermolecular is like the interstate. So you have I-70, which connects Kansas and Missouri, okay? So that's an interstate because it goes between those states. Intra is within the molecule itself. So you can talk about like the intra forces that hold a water molecule together. But the intermolecular forces are what holds water molecules themselves together, okay? So we're gonna, there, there's three big ones. There's the London dispersion forces, there's hydrogen bonding, and there's dipole bonding. And you can actually kind of have blends of all of these. So one of the first things I want you to get out of your mind is the idea that, oh, it can only be one of these. You can have all three of these. You can have two of these, okay? You, so don't get the idea that, oh, everything is just one type, okay? It isn't. So get that out of your minds right now. So let's start with the London dispersion forces. So a couple of things about London dispersion forces is that London dispersion forces are always present, okay? You cannot get away from London dispersion forces, and here's the reason why. The only requirement to have a London dispersion force is a nucleus and an electron cloud. That's it. That's the only thing you have to have. So even like a simple hydrogen atom with a nucleus and one electron, okay, that's capable of London dispersion forces. So what happens in this is that, first off, you're going to be talking about a bond that is going to occur between like, say, for example, uh, I don't know, methane, CH4, one, one that we're familiar with at this point, okay? So what's going to happen is that a methane molecule is going to run into another methane molecule, okay? Now, what happens is that this thing has a collective electron cloud, and so does this methane molecule. So what happens is that you induce a temporary dipole. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about dipoles later, and I've mentioned that in the previous lectures. But basically, a dipole points towards the neg a dipole is an arrow that points to the negative end of a molecule or an atom. So if you, if you look over here on this image over here, so on this one, notice that I've grouped the electrons on this right side. So what would happen is that this thing would temporarily have a dipole moment that would point to the right. Now, if there's an even distribution of the electrons, then it has technically a dipole moment, but all the dipole moments cancel themselves out. When you have a true dipole moment, then <coughs> that's going to point towards the negative end of the molecule or the atom itself. So basically what happens is this. The methane molecules themselves don't have dipole moments because they're balanced. So what happens is that these run into each other. And what happens is that these electrons, because of the chihuahuas of the, electro of the atomic world, don't like each other. So you have these electrons here, and what happens is that they force these electrons in this methane molecule to shift. And then it cascades through. So what happens is that this end of the molecule, right, because these electrons are going to, if you have these negative end over here, 
So you have a negative end of this methane molecule. It forces the electrons away from the methane molecule beside it. And then that leaves the positive end here. So right away what happens is that you have a positive end of this. Excuse me, I screwed that up. Let me back up. You have a negative end of this molecule temporarily attracted to the positive end of that. So, but keep in mind, this isn't a permanent thing. So this is just like a shift in this electron cloud. So what's going to happen is these, these electrons over here, then if there's another methane molecule over here that it happens on into, then you start like a cascade effect. So then when these electrons move over to the next methane molecule, that's going to shift those electrons over, and that's going to leave a positive region there for it to attract to. But these, I emphasize this, I cannot emphasize this enough. These are temporary dipole moments. They aren't permanent dipole moments like you'll see later on. So because of the fact that these are temporary, this is why these are like the weakest of all the intermolecular forces. But what happens is that as the molecules get bigger and bigger and bigger, and this is the whole key to this, the more electrons that you have in a molecule, the easier it is to induce a dipole moment. So it's kind of like a, a bowl of jello, if you're trying, trying to build something out of jello. If the taller that, that the taller the tower of jello gets, the more unstable it becomes, and it's easier to make that thing vibrate. So the same thing is true of molecules. So the bigger the molecule is, the easier it is to induce a dipole moment. Now, for those of you that are taking the AP test, if they ever ask you about dipole moments, don't just say, oh, London dispersion forces are stronger in a bigger atom because there's more electrons. I'm going to tell you right now, here's the phrase that they're looking for. You want to say in bigger molecules or bigger atoms, it is easier to induce a dipole moment, okay? That's one of the key things that you need to look at, is that now if you really want to get technical, you can talk about what's called polarizability, which is a fancy word for saying that if you have a big electron cloud, it's easier to induce a dipole moment. So with that said, when you look at dipole moments, there's two primary considerations. One is the number of electrons. The other one is the shape. So if you're comparing like two molecules, and let's say like they're linear, like so let's say that you have a carbon chain, okay? So if these molecules collide and, and, the, and they have a similar shape, that's also easier to induce a dipole moment because of the fact that you just have more surface area that can come in contact to create that temporary dipole moment. If you have molecules that are like, you know, trigonal pyramidal or something like that, they're like pointy edges, so it's harder to get these to induce a dipole moment just because when they collide, they don't have as much surface area. So that's another thing to consider in terms of the strength of the London dispersion forces is the shape of the molecules. So, but the biggest one without doubt is just the size of the electron cloud. So let me, so here's a good example. So methane, okay, which we've just talked about, has 10 electrons, and at room temperature, that's a gas. So you can think of these intermolecular forces as how sticky the molecules are. And some people like that word, and some people, for whatever reason, hate it when I use the word sticky. So if you don't like the word sticky, then I apologize, but I'm still, still going to use it. Okay. So basically what happens with methane, you've got your CH4 action going, okay? All right, life is good here. So this has a total of 10 electrons. So when these collide, you don't have a lot of electrons that can run into each other. So there's not very sticky. So this is why methane at room temperature is a gas. They do run into each other, but they're not sticky enough to coalesce into a liquid, okay? And that's the fundamental difference. So you can think of this London dispersion forces, oddly enough, in terms of second graders named Timmy. So here's Timmy, and here's another Timmy. And basically, 
what happens is that they have, imagine that they have little bits of Velcro attached to them on their shoulders. Okay, so you got a little bit of Velcro here and a little bit of Velcro here. So when Timmy runs into Tommy, there's this little bit of Velcro here that will make them want to stick together. But that's just a tiny little piece of Velcro. So they'll run into each other, they'll go, hey, how you doing? And then they're going to bounce off of each other. Now, what can happen is that you can get Timmy and Tommy to coalesce into a liquid. So one of the things that you can look at in terms of the strength of your intermolecular bonds is the boiling point, okay? So if you think about methane being a gas at room temperature, so hold on, give me one second. I'm going to pull up the boiling point of methane. Hold on, I got to type here. Of methane. Da -da. Come on. Okay, so the boiling point of methane, thanks to Google, is negative one sixty one point five degrees Celsius. Okay? So what that means is that at room temperature, which is 20 degrees Celsius, we are well above that point. Okay? So since we're well above that point, that means that methane is going to exist as a gas at room temperature. So you'd have to get down to like negative 162 to make methane turn into a liquid. So the other, th and, and this will play out large later on. So when you look at uh, this idea of what, what we can look at to figure out these intermolecular force strengths, one of them is boiling point. So the higher the boiling point, you know, negative 162 versus 20 degrees, whatever that is, the higher the boiling point, that means the molecules are more sticky and they have a stronger, stronger intermolecular force. Okay, now let me kind of get rid of all of this so that we can kind of see what we have going on here. Now, if you look at heptane, okay, heptane at room temperature is a liquid. So heptane has, is, has a lot of A lot of electrons, so that means it has a big electron cloud, much bigger than methane does. So that means that when these molecules run into each other, then because they have a stronger electron, a bigger electron cloud, it's easier for them to induce a temporary dipole moment. Now, I'm going to figure out the boiling point of heptane, just a little bit of comparison here. Boiling point of heptane is 200, and, excuse me, is, I was wrong, 98 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's about the boiling point of water. So you'd have to heat heptane up to 98 degrees to make it boil. So because basically these molecules are a lot stickier, okay, because they are a lot stickier than that means that these molecules at room temperature are going to stay together as liquid. So this is like putting Velcro suits on Timmy and Tommy. So here's Timmy and here's Tommy. And we've got like instead of little pieces of Velcro, we've got big pieces of Velcro. So now when they run into each other, they're much stickier and they're going to stick together. And this is why heptane is a liquid at room temperatures, but methane is a gas. Now, if you go in an insane situation, okay, you can get octadecane, which has 146 electrons. So these are these big, massive ones. So what's happening here is that because of the fact that these have so many electrons, that there's such strong London dispersion forces that it actually holds it together as a solid. So this is like Timmy and Tommy 
being in complete Velcro suits, and, the, and there's just no way that they can break apart because of the fact that now you have these complete Velcro suits that there weren't. So, here's the story about London Dispersion Forces. I cannot emphasize this enough. It is the only force that is always present because the only thing you have to have is an electron cloud. The bigger the electron cloud is, the easier it is to induce a dipole moment, okay? The bigger the electron cloud is, the easier it is to induce a dipole moment and the stronger those, that stronger those London, London dispersion forces are gonna be. And if you wanna be cool, London dispersion forces are usually just written as LDF. Okay, now let's talk about hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding is one of the most misconstrued ideas in all of chemistry because everybody wants to think that hydrogen bonding exists between the hydrogen atoms, okay? So let me get this out of the way right now. Hydrogen bonding exists between a hydrogen atom, oddly enough, here, and, listen to me very carefully, between oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine in another molecule. So listen to me. The hydrogen bond does not exist within a water molecule. So this is not a hydrogen bond between the hydrogen and this oxygen. The hydrogen bond is between this hydrogen and the oxygen molecule of, or the oxygen atom of another water molecule. Okay? So get this out of your little minds right now. I beg of you. Have get this out. Hydrogen bonding, okay? This is not hydrogen bonding within the water molecule. Hydrogen bonding is between a hydrogen atom and an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine of another molecule. So let me give you an example. So let's say that you have methane, okay? So methane has a whole bunch of hydrogen atoms. Oh, okay, right, it's got four of them. Along comes another methane. Oh, you got four of those, right? Guess what? There's no hydrogen bonding that's taking place, mainly because the hydrogen here cannot be attracted to a, to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine in that other methane molecule. So just because a molecule has hydrogen, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, does not mean that you're going to have hydrogen bonding. Okay, obviously you do have to have hydrogen, but you've got to have oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine in another molecule to bond to that. So that's one of the most important things that you have to understand. So if there's, for those of you that are taking the test or just general knowledge, these are the big three, oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine. So just because you have hydrogen, doesn't mean that you're going to have hydrogen bonding, okay? So let me get that straight right now. And it exists because, remember, these are intermolecular forces, not intramolecular forces. So here's a hydrogen bond, here's a hydrogen bond, there's a hydrogen bond. But that hydrogen bond does not exist within the water molecule itself. So get that out of your minds right now. Okay. Now, then we have dipole-dipole. Okay, now, so this, this I, I chose this image because it has a nice comparison of these two. So we've talked about dipole-dipole when we were talking about London dispersion forces. So notice with the dipole-dipole, number one, you have an arrow that's pointing in the direction of the negative end of a molecule. So here you've got water. So you've got two unbound pairs of electrons, and that's what's creating that dipole. Then, over here, this is carbon and chlorine and a hydrogen and a hydrogen and a chlorine, okay? Now, so with this one, this is going to have a dipole moment because these chlorine atoms have this big negative end on the end of it. So this dipole moment is pointing towards the negative end of that molecule because of the large number of, uh, because this huge electron cloud that is existing out here, okay? So, if you look at what's going to happen with 
this dipole dipole. So it's kind of like magnets in the sense that opposites attract or unlike charges attract. So basically what's going to happen here in this dipole dipole bonding is that the negative end of one water mo of a molecule is going to be attracted to the positive end of the other. So that's what's happening in this situation where you have the negative dipole of that arrow is pointing in one direction and that would be attracted to the other molecule's positive end. Now, in contrast to that, let's talk about hydrogen bonding. So here, notice that, again, notice that this hydrogen bonding here is existing between this hydrogen and this oxygen right here, and between this oxygen and this hydrogen in here. Notice that the hydrogen bonding is not occurring within the water molecule itself. So right away, I want you to get that out of your minds. Gone. Out of there. Boom. Now, the other thing over here is that you could have hydrogen bonding between this hydrogen and that oxygen, but you cannot have oxygen bonding with this chlorine because it's not nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Okay. So here's a summary. So your London dispersion forces on a comparison, and, and this is kind of comparing the same size of molecules, is the weakest. But that doesn't mean that you can't have London dispersion forces that create a solid. If you have a big enough electron cloud, you can actually have very strong London dispersion forces. But you have to have a really, 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 really big molecule to make that happen. Now, then you got dipole dipole. So with dipole dipole, what's happening here? Like for example, here's HCl. So this dipole moment would point in this direction because this is this big negative cloud around the chlorine. That hydrogen is given up its electron. So this is the positive end and that's the negative end. And then so what's gonna happen is that this molecule here is going to be attracted to this end of the next hydrochloric molecule which is right beside it but again this is not london this is not hydrogen bonding because this is not nitrogen oxygen or fluorine <clears throat> now hydrogen bonding now this is where you can have hydrogen bonding because with ammonia notice that you have nh3 so there's nitrogen there's a hydrogen, and that's going to be bound to and attracted to that other nitrogen. So if you look at like hydrogen bonding here, so this actually is a good situation in which you have more than one force taking place. So you have London dispersion forces, and all of these have London dispersion forces because they all have electron clouds. But this has this one has London dispersion forces because they have electron clouds, and it has hydrogen bonding, okay? So this is a situation where you could have more than one type. Now, if you look at water molecules, so water molecules are pretty cool. And without them, we wouldn't be here having this discussion. So with the, what makes water a liquid, and if you think about it, you don't deal with that many liquids in your life. I mean, that aren't like water-based, seriously. You have water, tea, Danae, you have your tea. Uh, you have power drinks, okay? You have blood, whatever. All of those are basically water-based. You really don't run into that many liquids in your life, if you think about it, other than water. Water is by far and away the most common liquid. So what happens is that the reason that water is a liquid, because number one, you have big electron clouds, so you have London dispersion forces, okay? You also have, because this dome of negativity, and this is why we talked about structure first, so it has a dipole moment, so you have dipole bonding, okay? Then you also have, wait for it, hydrogen bonding between the hydrogen and the oxygen. So water is unique, in the sense that it has all three of these intermolecular forces happening at the same time. 
So that's why I said I don't want you to think that, oh, it's just exclusive to one type of force. You can have multiple forces happening, but the one that is the only one that is always present is London dispersion forces. So remember that about London dispersion forces. By uh, the hydrogen bonding, remember NOF, you got to have a nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine that the hydrogen can bond to. Okay. Now, to give you kind of a cool example, if you look at the boiling point of methanol. Ah, oh, I misspelled that. Hold on. I'm backing up. Okay. So, here's a good example. So, methane, right, our friend methane, has a boiling point of negative 258.7 Fahrenheit. Okay, I'm going to Fahrenheit. Now, methanol, and the only difference between methanol is the fact that it has an OH group on it. That boiling point is 148.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So here's why this changes, and this is where boiling point is an indicator of the strength of intermolecular forces. So if you'll notice, if you have methane, the only type of intermolecular force that you can have is London dispersion forces. You can't have hydrogen bonding and there's no dipole moment. But if you look at methanol, okay, and the only difference that we did is that we swapped out a hydrogen for an OH group. Now, look at, what they did, look at what that did to that boiling point. This is why methanol is a liquid. Methanol is the same thing as methyl alcohol. This is why methyl alcohol is a liquid at room temperature. Because by swapping out a hydrogen, a hydrogen for an OH group, now look what happens. Number one, you're going to have a dipole moment because you're going to have this oxygen with these unbound pairs of electrons. So now in a, you've also increased the number of electrons, so you're going to have a stronger amount of London dispersion forces. And, and wait for it, now you can have hydrogen bonding because uh, if you bring another methanol over here, that oxygen can bond to that hydrogen. So this is why methanol is liquid at room temperature, but methane is a gas at room temperature. It has to do with how sticky they are. So this is a nice comparison to shows what happens if you just swap out a hydrogen for a functional alcohol group or an OH group. Okay, it is now 8.15. Today has been a monumental struggle. So I will get this posted, and uh, here we go. See you, kid.